New song for a new era. Welcome back. History of England, episode 26. Working in the chain gang. Last time, we looked at the very brief reign of King Edward V and how he was pushed out of power by his uncle Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who became King Richard III. And we kind of discussed if Richard really did have his two nephews killed, and you know, I possibly believe he did, possibly believe he didn't, but. We looked at the ways in which Richard reigned, as well as the rise and eventual triumph of Henry Tudor, crowned King Henry VII, beginning the Tudor dynasty in England. Now, I think before we talk about the Tudor dynasty, we should look, take a pause and look at England in 1485. At that time, the population of England and Wales was about 2.2 million down from 6 million in 1348 due to the Black Death and recurring plague epidemics afterwards. English also was subject to smallpox, cholera, typhus, typhoid fever, something called the sweating sickness, and whooping cough ep epidemics, as well as bad harvests. 25% of harvests were always bad. There's also famines, accidents, fire, drowning, violence. The average life expectancy in 1485 was about 35 years old. Old people were extremely rare. About 20% of people did not live to see their first birthday. This entire decline in population produced a labor shortage, which was good news for labor. Few workers and the serfdom, higher wages, lower food prices, lower rents, bad news for land on elites who had to pay these high wages and depend on the yield from low food and rent. Now, only about 10% of English people lived in cities in 1485. London was the biggest, 50,000 people. The center of trade, the center of government, a crossroads, north to south, east to west. There's also cities like Bristol, which had 10,000 depending on the sea trade. Norwich is about 10,000 and made its living out of the cloth trade. And York, also about 10,000, making its living as the main city of the north. There's other smaller cathedral market country towns like Salisbury, Hampshire, Dorchester, Dorset, and Rye. Maybe about 1,000 people, except during market and fair days. Now, all cities, all of them depended on the wool trade in one way or another, which made them vulnerable when the trade stagnated. But in any case, most people did not live in cities. Most people lived in the country on manors and in villages. Now, a manor was the estate of a great landlord set apart from the village, often on the hill. The church would be the heart of the village socially, culturally, physically. It was the only stone building in the village, it was where study services were held, where holy days were celebrated, all the rites of passages, baptism, marriage, death were solemnized in the church. Now, everyone went to church, no matter what. The church was Roman Catholic at the time. Okay? The church was all, where all the news was distributed. It was the social side of the village. Feasting, drinking, services, sports, reception, wakes, all held at the church. Now, everyone in the village lived in small homes made of mud and straw. Each house had two rooms, shared with animals during the winter, with a hearth in the center. Possessions were pots and pans, a table, stools, candles, clothes. People slept on mattresses stuffed with straw. They worked in fields rented from the landlord, arranged in long strips because ease of plowing. The reason being is they usually plowed oxen, and oxen really take a while to turn, so you just have one long strip. They worked sun up to sundown. Women and children joined them at the plowing and harvest times. Other times, women would tend animals and spin and wove wool. Now, in the towns, merchants worked as millermen and craftsmen. They made and they sold things. Residents in port cities worked in trade associated with the sea or ran inns and taverns that catered to sailors. Now, when times are good for all, the diet was fairly healthy. Bread, pea soup, cheese, meat, ale... Less than 10% owned land. 50% of the land in England was owned by the top 1% of the population. Top 1%. The landlords could and did demand rents and military service and defense and deference from their people. In return, they provide legal, military, economic protection, as well as kind of like a fatherly care and hospitality to people. Now, when people of the late medieval and early modern era thought about the universe, 
they thought kind of what Plato had taught. The Earth was at the center. When they thought about inhabitants at the universe, they would think about hierarchy called the Great Chain of Being. Now, the Great Chain of Being is arranged from top to bottom. God, who dwells everywhere. Angels, who travel from Earth, heaven to mankind as needed. Man who lived on Earth. Animals who lived on Earth. Plants who lived on and in the Earth. And finally, stones which lived in the Earth. Okay. Now, note, those close to the top are close to God. Humans halfway down between angels and animals. Now, apart from God, each of these ranks would be divided further. The angels had nine ranks, including seraphim and cherubim and so on. Animals were headed by the lion, plants by the oak, stones by the regal diamond, on and on. For humans, the king was at the top. In England, he owned 5% of all the land. Under him was the nobility, and in 1485, it was made up of about 60 families with titles that were inherited. Each head of the nobility set in the House of Lords, they owned about 10% of the land. Next down came the gentry, made of about 3,000 knights, esquires, and gentlemen, who, if they were prominent, set in the House of Commons, and they all together owned about 15% of the land. So now we have 15, 10, 5, 30% um, of the land, right there, those top three classes. Now, under them was a yeoman, farmers, lots of land, and then husbandmen, who had a small plot of land rented from the yeoman, and cottagers who rented a cottage but had no land, and then laborers who had no cottage, no land, they worked and lived on someone else's farm, and then the poor. Permanent residence, no permanent residence, no visible means of support, okay? And each of these ranks would be subdivided. The nobles, dukes, and marquises, and earls, and viscounts, and barons, and further divided depending on how old the title was. Each human also had their own great chain of being. The families, the father, the mother, the male children in birth order, the female children in birth order. So in theory, every single creature and object in God's universe could be placed precisely in a great chain of being. The head of each part of this chain represented the head of the whole chain, God. So the king represented God in the country. The father represented God in the family. The lion represented God among the beast. The diamond represented God among the stones. The oak, God among the plants. God, okay, they've been placed there by God. They had God's power. They were made like God. This is a chain. It's not a ladder. You didn't climb it. You did not climb up. You did not climb down. Now, the head of each part of the chain, okay, sorry. Now, if you attack the chain, disobey your superiors. Try to rise to another rank. You are attacking God. You are a grave sinner. Now, remember, consider the top three ranks of the human train represents only about a half of 1% of the people in England. But they own 30% of the land, and nearly 100% of the power. So why did not the other 99.5% 9 attack them? They didn't because they were educated to put up with this great chain from their parish priests, which taught the great chain week in, week out from the pulpit. And remember, everyone had to go to the same church, no alternative. The landlord would appoint the pastor. Everyone was taught to believe that everything that was unequal in the chain was really, you know, Part of what God wanted. They were traded, trained in two important concepts, paternalism and deference. So, paternalism, belief that the elites were responsible to look after those below them. They provided military and legal protection, jobs and economic assistance, hospitality and holidays. In return, those below had to pay back by serving the military, attending church, paying taxes, paying tithes, obeying those above them, bowing, courtesy, tipping the caps, Giving the wall to those above them. What does it mean giving the wall? It means you're walking down a street and you saw your landlord coming toward you. You gave the wall to him, okay? You stepped into the street. He got the wall. Why is that bad? Because stepping in the street, the streets were sewers. People threw their crap out. Literally, their crap out. Water, piss, poop, garbage, everything landed in the middle of the street. So you're walking in garbage and sewage, really. Okay, by 1485, this chain was falling apart. Some people know suddenly that nobles were moving up, or dying off, or being deprived of titles by, titles by acts of treason. No one knew just exactly what made up a gentleman. Anyone with money could buy a coat of arms. Anyone with money could fake a pedigree. And if wealth mattered in the form of land, then merchants and lawyers who suddenly had money and were buying land were wealthy. Not all bothered to buy land, but simply had money, which they used for education, which it must be said, not all above had. 
In fact, in 1485, you were brazen enough you could get away with calling yourself a gentleman and back it up. Okay, how about those below the gentry? Yeomen, husbandmen, those below rose and fell when the economy is good or bad due to good and bad harvest. Remember, every four years was a bad harvest. So sometimes there was work, sometimes there wasn't. They would follow the chain entirely. And what do you do with those who did not live on the land? Cities had their own social chain. Did not match the main chain. In cities, the ranks were mayor, aldermen, who sat on the town council, citizens, who were free men, members of golds, then journeymen, and apprentices, and everybody else. In cities, you could be anyone you wanted to be, as it was harder to tell where you belonged. You go rich or poor quickly, rise and fall in status. Then there's the church, own chain of being. Pope, archbishop, bishop, priest, nuns, laity. Was the pope equal to the king? And so, what if he did not agree with the king? Who would people listen to and follow? The pope had access to God. The king was supposed to represent God. All these questions being attacked as Henry VII took the throne. Okay? Whew. Okay. I'll come down. Now, Henry Tudor had lived a life of poverty and exile most of his life. When Edward IV had won the throne... He had been smuggled from Wales to Brittany by his uncle Jasper Tudor. Now, if Richard III had not seized the throne, he would have lived out of life, out of his life, as isolated, obscure, Zion of the Lancastrian family, offspring of the bastard, but later lived generalized line of John the Gaunt. But because of Richard, what he did, Henry seized his moment and the crown. Now, after the victory at Bosworth Field, he made his way slowly south to allow his subjects to see him. He was slender. He was strong, just about above average height. Extremely handsome, blue eyes, high cheekbones, a high bridge pointed nose, thin lips. Now later on, his hair would go white, his teeth would go black with decay, they'd fall out, his complexion would become sallow. But that's all the future of 1485. This is a good king. He's a beautiful man. Now the coronation was fixed October 30th, 1485. Our parliament was called to meet on November 7th, 1485. And the Parliament declared that Henry had started his reign on August 21st. So therefore, Richard III, despite being a lawful king, had acted as a traitor because he attacked the true king on August 22nd. How strange. And yet Henry was strange. He was careful, careful enough that he wanted to be crowned before Parliament met so he could claim the crown. He could claim that they had not offered him the crown. He had seized it. Okay. But what right did Henry have the crown? Not from fact of birth. He had derived all his right of birth from his mother, but she was still alive. So the crown should be hers. In fact, she would just about outlive him. And it not, could not be because of his marriage to Elizabeth of York, because if that was so, then if she died before Henry, he might theoretically have to abdicate and give place to their children by marriage. So. That's why he kept postponing the marriage until after the coronation, so he became king before husband. The reason given for him being king was that he had defeated Richard in battle. Now, the last 30 years, the crown had changed by force five times, it must be said, so battle could not really be the deciding factor. Richard had been a disaster in many ways. He was not mourned. But Henry was a usurper whose rule must be endured, not enjoyed. The power and importance of the crown must be continued, considered tarnished a bit. There was no dawn in England. Eventually, Henry had to get the bull from the Pope to guarantee his authority. Now, in the early years of his reign, Henry was never secure on the throne. Never. It was only in the last ten years that he settled back and enjoyed being king. He had spent his life in exile. He did not know much of the English people he ruled. He had never been in the English government. He never owned any great tracts of land in England. He was happiest when he could speak French to someone. The noble families never considered him on their own. Only two nobles had fought at Bosworth, and they were exiles. So at 28 years old, Henry was king without experience. He had to win support, slowly. He was always suspicious. He always had 200 bodyguards around him. They were known as the Yeomen of the Guard. He also sent garrisons to Plymouth and Berwick to hold off any potential evasion. But he dressed like a king. He claimed his descent from Brit Brutus, the Trojan founder of London, and he said his kind uncle, Henry VI, was his model. 
In fact, he spent much of his time and effort trying to have Henry VI made a saint by the church. It really didn't work. He was also the first king in England to put his likeness on the coins, either in profile or sitting on the throne crowned. He spent a lot of money on his court, and they became notable for his ceremonies and displays. He refurbished the royal image by inducing the motif of the white and red rose into the twine as a symbol of regal unity. But Henry was always a king on edge at first. There were a few minor rebellions by Yorkists in the early days of Worcester and Wales. They were easily dealt with. And in 1486, an heir to the throne was born, named Arthur. Since the child was born in Win Winchester, where the supposed round table was held. Yes, that's right. Arthur. Okay. But then, at the end of 1486, a very serious attack on his throne took place. The Yorkists claimed they had rescued the young Earl Warwick, son of the late Duke of Clarence, and thus proper heir to the throne from prison. This is enough to rouse all the hopes of the defeated. In fact, the real Earl Warwick was still in the Tower of London, locked up, but that did not diminish enthusiasm. The boy, this pretender, had emerged in Dublin on May 24, 1487, to proclaim King Edward VI, crowned using a crown taken from the statue of the Virgin Mary. In reality, the young man was named Lambert Simnel. We don't know much about his early life. It seems that for some reason, whoever came up with the idea of using the younger man saw the he had the talent to personate a young earl. Now, King Edward VI's sister, Margaret of Burgundy, who made it her life's work to restore the Yorkist dynasty, actually believed this was her nephew. And other Yorkist supporters, like the Earl of Lincoln and Lord Lovell, were eager to participate in the conspiracy. Among the members of the group, however, was Elizabeth Woodville, widow of King Edward IV, the mother-in-law of Henry VII. And why she joined is unclear, though it might be because she felt a bit humiliated by Henry. He had seized the crown. And she believed that he was not treating her daughter with respect and kindness. He delayed the wedding. He was still refusing to have her officially crowned queen. He hated the Yorkists, after all. He had been fighting them his whole life, and he had only married Elizabeth of York for political reasons. So his mother-in-law turned against him and supported this young pretender to the throne. Now, Henry was very alarmed at the threat, and he had the real Earl Warwick taken from prison cell, paraded through the streets of London, and he had him talk to those who knew him, and he had him attend Mass at St. Paul's. Of course, the Yorkists simply denounced him as the imposter. Meanwhile, Margaret Burgundy hired 2,000 German mercenaries, placed them under the command of Earl of Lincoln. These mercenaries landed in Dublin. They enlisted more men to the army, then sailed to England with a young pretender. Henry rode at the head of the royal army against them. They met at the East Stoke on June 16th, and the royal army defeated the pretender's army. The Earl Lincoln was killed in the battle. Simnel was captured. Lord Lovell fled the battle. He actually hid for the rest of his life in the vault in, or in Oxfordshire. His skeleton was found there in the early 18th century. Anyway, it's important to note that the many nobles had held back from supporting Henry with various excuses. But in, in the end, the Battle of East Stoke may be considered the final battle of the War of the Roses. Lambert Simnel was taken back to London. He was made a turnspit in the royal kitchen. He would later rise and become the falconer of the king. Elizabeth Woodville, Elizabeth Woodville, she was sent to a nunnery. She spent the rest of her life there. But Henry realized he needed to stabilize and strengthen his power. So he usually preferred to govern through friends instead of nobles in England, and why he allowed the nobles to have a say, he never trusted them. He surrounded himself with a group of men who owned all their loyalty to him. He won loyals, lawyers, not nobles, and merchants, not lords. Of course, he knew he needed the nobles in England to control the counties where they lived, since there was no police force in those days, no standing army, so he counted them as supporters. But he's always careful not to make their number larger, and only created three earls and five peers in his whole reign. Now, he also worked through tribunals and courts he controlled, the most famous of these being the Court of Star Chamber, which is used to all no nobles to submit to him. They were found guilty of perverting justice or having small army retainers or inciting disorder, they were quickly punished, and there's no jury, no appeal. The court was held in a chamber painted with stars. That's how it got its name, okay? 
Now, Henry also involved himself in the matters of the royal finance and he went through his account books line by line, initially in every single line. We still have these account books. He was determined to exact every possible claim and right he possessed as king, so he was not that different from those that come before him. He made stronger his personal hold over his cash by diverting much of his earnings from the exchequer to his personal treasury, which was held in chest in his bedroom, and this included fees and fines and payments to the crown. And he continued to support Brittany in struggles against France, since Brittany had supported him when he was in exile. He placed troops there in the duchy, armed with prepared for war against France. He gathered a fleet to persuade the parliament to raise a tax to pay for all of this. Now, he knew that war would make him rich, after all. He also knew that Charles VIII of France was eager to distract and destabilize him, and he knew he was talking to Scotland and Ireland about possible revolt against his rule. So, it wasn't surprising, in November 1491, a young 17-year-old came out of Cork, claimed to be Richard, Duke of York, the younger of the two princes of the Tower. He stated he was Richard IV, the true king of England. He escaped from the Tower of London. He knew all about the court of Edward IV. He could tell stories about his days in prison in the Tower. He declared he'd been taken from the Tower, sent to a lord to be executed privately. But this is Lord in Cork, at the exacting your oath that he would not reveal who he was for a certain number of years. But now it's time to reveal himself. And so he did, and some were convinced he was who he was. But in reality, his name was Pekin Warbeck, son of a Flemish boatman. Now the Earl of Kildare, who controlled Ireland, did not wish this young pretender to be in Ireland. He had supported Lambert Simnel four years before. He did not wish me to anger the king by supporting yet another Yorkist pretender. So he sent the young man to France, and there Charles VIII welcomed him as the true king of England, and paid him a large or paid for a large retinue. Now, at this time, Henry was showing that he was starting to get sick. He was frustrated. He was fearful. So he made a treaty with Charles VIII, eager to avoid war with Brittany with one clause, being that Charles no longer supported any enemies of Henry. Warbuck quickly crossed the border, made his way to the court of Margaret of Burgundy, who quickly declared him her nephew and the rightful king. Now, Margaret made sure that the pretender had wealthy and influence influential allies. He was sent to the funeral Holy Roman Emperor Frederick III in Vienna, and there he met Maximilian, who was now controlling the entire Habsburg Empire, and the two became best friends. And soon the pretender was coining his own silver, and he had his own bodyguards. Now Henry, meanwhile, was not idle. He applied trade sanctions against the Burgundian territories, where Warbuck was still being sheltered and he barred English cloth and goods from the Netherlands. The financial consequences were severe for England and for the Netherlands, but it was ignored by both sides. Henry spent money trying to learn who Pekin Warbuck really was, and his envoys were sent to Europe to tell the facts of his true heritage. Now the king feared an invasion would soon occur, so he sent the Royal Navy to patrol the seas around the Suffolk coast and ordered the troops to guard the post of England and send word to supporters to supply him with man-at-arms who would be ready at a day's notice. The king also had his spies in Warwick's court. He soon learned that the York Yorkists working with Henry, the Yorkists had, he soon learned that the Yorkists had people working for Henry in his court and his household, and that they were ready to rise up. So the time came to arrest and throw them in prison. The most senior conspirator was still Sir William Stanley, his chamberlain, who had helped Henry win the Battle of Bosworth. Now, at his trial, he stated he had known that the young Richard Plantagenet was alive. Oh, sorry, he stated that if he had known that the young Richard Plantagenet was alive, he would never have risen against the family. Guess what happened? He was quickly found guilty and executed by beheading. On July 3rd, 1495, the pretender landed a mercenary army at Deal in Kent, but the invasion was ill thought out. His forces overwhelmed the young Warbuck, returned to safety to sea, his men were marched to either Newgate Prison or the Tower of London. Henry was glad the English had chosen not to rise with Warbuck, Warwick. Now, Warbeck, sorry, not Warwick, Warbeck. Warbuck sailed on to Ireland, he, but he landed at Waterford, and the citizens actively resisted attempts to be enlisted to his cause. For, so for months he wandered around Ireland, living secretly, 
living fearfully. Then his fortune changed. James IV of Scotland invited him to come to Edinburgh to live at his court. James was eager to embarrass and weaken England, and so in the winter of 1495, Warbeck arrived, treated like a conquering hero. He was rewarded by James with Catherine Gordon, a close relative of the Scottish Queen, and his two soon became engaged and they got married. Meanwhile, James and Warbeck planned the border war, hoping the English would rise to the occasion in this way. Henry was not sure what had happened, so he mustered an army of 20,000. He launched his navy to harry the Scots. He increased taxes. He forced people to pay him loans for an invasion of Scotland. But in the end, the border war turned out to be really nothing much. Warbuck stated he was horrified by the Scottish troops, breaking, which broke up the friendship between James and Warbuck. He lived on in Scotland for a few more months, but he was frozen out of the court. So he decided one more full invasion, risk everything. He and his wife sailed to Cornwall, passing through Ireland with a small army, because he has been told there are rebels in Cornwall who would support him because of the unjust taxes of Henry. But again, because Warbuck was Warbuck, he was unsuccessful. And while some men from Devon and Somerset joined him, the town of Exeter refused to allow him entry. His father started to desert him. King Henry had sent messages, messen- yeah, messengers out that if they landed in their arms, they would be pardoned. Warbuck, realizing he was defeated, fled for sanctuary at the abbey in Belu. Henry surrounded the church. Warbuck succeeded, surrendered. He was taken back to London, forced to confess he was a bastard in Margaret of Burgundy, and a local priest, and then he'd been raised to his current role. He may be an ambassador Henry Edward IV, we will never know. Warbeck escaped from his guards at the Palace of Westminster, we he'd been kindly held, and he was quickly recaptured, sent to the town of London. He stayed there for more than a year. He could have stayed there the rest of his life. But then the real Earl, Earl of Warwick, still in prison, accused Warbeck of plotting treason, and so Warbeck was hanged and Warwick beheaded. Two birds, one stone for Henry. Henry believed after 14 years as king, he was now secure on the throne. But that could be because he inspired not loyalty, but fear in the English people. In December 1499, he fell ill, and though he recovered, his health was gravely damaged. Sensing that his, he was going to die soon, he started to spend time attending daily mass and consulting with astrologers and soothsayers. Kind of really ruins both, but anyway. In the spring of 1502, his heir, Arthur, died of some unknown illness. That left his younger brother, Henry, heir to the throne. Now, six months before his death, Arthur had married Catherine the Aragon, which had bound together the English and Spanish thrones, but now, with Arthur's death, Prince Henry was engaged to her. But Henry VII held off marriage, hoping that he could find someone better for his heir. To make the marriage valid in the eyes of God, Henry arranged a papal dispensation. This is important, stating that Arthur and Catherine had never had sex, so therefore were never married in the usual sense. This allowed Prince Henry to be engaged to young princesses. The following year, Elizabeth of York died. She suffered a miscarriage. She died of a postpartum infection. Henry VII was severely affected by this new sorrow. He is queen given a ceremonial funeral in Westminster Abbey. Two years later, he announced he was ready to marry again. He sent envoys to the Queen of Naples as well as to Jonah of Castile, even though the latter was known to be insane. But in the end, none of these bore fruit. Henry would never marry again. He finally enjoyed a bit of success, however, when he managed to marry James IV of Scotland to his eldest daughter, Margaret Tudor, which consolidated the position of England among the ruling class in Europe. This is going to be important in a few hundred years later on. Okay. Now he also started to persuade pursue trade once more in the low countries. He sent wool and cloth to them. He looked everywhere in Europe for new trade partners. He was doing this not because he wanted to see United Europe, because he wanted to become rich. The custom revenues member went straight to him. He also traded personally. In one year he made fifteen thousand pounds from importing alum used to make soap. In fact, the figure of the king in the Song of Sixpence is based on Henry VII. 
In searching out for profit, he supported John Cabot and his three sons on a voyage of discovery to the New World, only a year after Columbus. Cabot landed on the coast of North America. Believed he was in Asia, he sent back three Native Americans from Newfoundland to Henry's court. They were housed in Westminster. Within two years, they acted and spoke like Englishmen. By 1504, however, Henry VII had become paranoid. The senior members of his household had helped Pekin and Warbeck to try and restore the Yorkist dynasty. So he now set himself apart from those he usually surrounded himself with. He established a privy chamber to which only best friends had access. He lived and worked in private city chambers secluded from the open reception rooms of the great chamber and president's chamber. He also stopped summoning parliament. 1504 was his last parliament. But he still maintained a magnificent court. He arranged for jousts and possessions and tournaments. He had tumblers and dancers brought before him. He purchased animals for the royal zoo. He hired freaks to amuse his court. He enjoyed gambling and hawking and hunting, mostly with the fools of his court. But he was not doing any of this. He spent time with his advisors and his two favorites, Richard Empson and Edmund Dudley, who were assigned to harry and prosecute the great nobles of England. And they were in charge of a committee called the Council Learned of the Law, whose only purpose was to enforce the rights of the king and collect his debts. But they had a rather informal way of proceeding. See, if they targeted the family and that family had spent little or no outward show, surely they could afford a small present of money for Henry. And if that family had spent lavishly and lived in style, of course they could afford to share the wealth of the king. And they also imposed fines upon members of the nobility who had breached the law as they saw it. They accused anyone by handing a writ to a judge, and the person did not show up for the summons, then his goods would be seized and he'd be imprisoned until the king decided to allow him out. So towards the end, Henry brought the obedience of his nobles, not their loyalty, never their loyalty. Feared by all, never loved, never admired. He feared much of the world. He tried to protest and protect himself with a wall of money. In the process, the yearly royal income increased by 45% when a few monarchs of England declare his debts and leave money to his heir. The first king, Sir Henry V, to pass on his crown about dispute. Money was power. It allowed him to protest his throne and his dynasty. He kept the poor poor. Either way, that made him party, he said. He was harsh, he was greedy in his last years, but he was also dying. And after 1506, he was an invalid. In his will, he asked that 2,000 masses be said for his soul in one month. And he paid six pence for each mass. And then April 21st, 1509, Henry VII died of tuberculosis at Richmond Palace. And he was buried next to his wife at Westminster Abbey. There was relief in England. There was open rejoicing in England. But the worst was yet to come. Next time we'll be looking at Henry the Eighth. Thank you.